Hello, Jason. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks. Uh, how about you, John? I'm doing great as well. Thanks for asking. You know, um, so I just want to give you thank you very much for your time. Uh, like that we can talk about Eternal Springs. Uh, I really got to say uh, it was my first film to cover when I was a part of the nerdy basement. And the first thing that I told my head editor is that this film is phenomenal. I love the fact that it's a documentary, but at the same time, it it feels as a film as well. So mm -hmm. wanted to ask you, uh, Jason, what inspired you to bring this story to the world? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Good question. Um, I was making a Kung Fu video game actually a few years ago, and we wanted to have this visual novel component to it. And we wanted to use a bunch of hand-drawn artwork. And so we found this artist who was living in New York at the time, originally from China named Dashong. And mm -hmm. he had drawn for Justice League and Star Wars. And he'd also worked with uh, Jin Yong or Louis Cha, who's kind of the leading Kung Fu novelist in China. So we thought he had like this perfect combination of great artistic ability as well as the cultural background that would allow him to work with us on that and so we brought him up and we were collaborating on this game and then we learned that he came from the same hometown as my wife and producing partner Masha Loftus which is a city in northeast China called Changchun but um, Dashong was part of the Falun Gong community there as we see in the film and they had been subject to this repression and he'd had this sort of harrowing escape uh, in the aftermath of this dramatic tv hijacking and Masha, on the other hand, was, uh, you know, she was the daughter of a mid-level government official, not part of the Falun Gong community. For her, just hearing what people had been enduring sort of under her nose in her own city, I think really hit home. And she felt it was an important story that she wanted to share and that she felt was important for China, that people see this story. And for me, I had an interest when I was back in high school in Eastern philosophy and meditation. And so I had encountered Falun Gong prior to there being a persecution in China. And when the persecution did start and the Chinese state media started saying these people are evil and dangerous and we need to get rid of them, um, I guess it, I just really couldn't reconcile what I was hearing with that in that narrative with my own encounters with the with the community and with my own experiences with Falun Gong. So for me, um, that planted this kind of seed of interest of, you know, the misinformation campaign around around Falun Gong and kind of a sympathy for the human rights issue. So when Dashong sort of fell into our laps with this project we were collaborating on, you know, we were both for different reasons, really interested in pursuing this story. And at the same time, I felt from a filmmaking perspective, there was something really unique here. I, I do work in documentaries. I work in animation as well. And so I guess there's probably always been this opportunity for some type of, you know, intersection between the two of them in my mind. Um, but at the same time, you know, when I see animation used in documentary, it's most often just sort of this decision by the invisible hand of the director. We just sort of see the animation, but we don't know what decisions artistically have gone into it. We don't know who's who's doing that art and what interpretations and personal sort of um, viewpoints might be sort of embedded in it. So I felt this was a unique opportunity because here we have an artist whose personal story is intertwined with these events. He's deeply, he's been deeply affected by them. You know, he's, he's been separated from his home. He's endured the pain of torture. He's got all of that wrapped up in wanting to understand this event and the people who were like directly responsible for the hijacking. And he was willing to go on this journey with us. And, and, and he seemed to want to face this event and really kind of process it. So <clears throat> from my perspective, that gave us the opportunity to pull the curtain back and to be able to see the artistic process playing out on screen and to see this artist as he you know, through his artwork faces these events and comes to hopefully some kind of new understanding through them. And for me, that that lent the potential of exploring the role that art can play when we're dealing with traumatic events and, you know, the power that art has to help us, whether it's healing or understanding or, you know, hopefully reaching some type of catharsis. Okay, that's that's really amazing. Um, so how was the process of yourself and Dax Young working together in bringing, um, you know, because uh, you just mentioned you worked in animation and as well in, in film, uh, but Dax Young has, uh, for what I've seen, he's much more as an artist. And how mm -hmm. did those two worlds collide and work together? Yeah, I think we benefited a lot from having collaborated together on the video game, Shuyan Saga, because 
through that, we were able to, you know, he's working in two dimensions and, you know, with his 2D illustrations and we were using 2D panels in the game, but we were also taking sort of interactive scenes in the game and trying to just bring them in his style, a consistent style, but working in a 3D, um, you know, uh, gameplay environment. And so we had some of this kind of like experimentation through that of how we could collaborate with him. And then when it came to this film, I think we were sort of continuing down that road. So this is a conversation, you know, Yvonne Pinard, who's the producer who oversees the animation side of things. And then David St. Amat, who's our animation director. Collectively, we would be brainstorming around how we could realize Dashon's uh, art in this film. And so, it, you know, Dash, as you mentioned, Dashon's drawings, although they're beautiful and they're stunning and they have all this detail that really kind of gives you this feeling at the same time, they're still drawings. And so they're two dimensional and they're flat. And how do you, and this is the challenge we face with the film, how do you bring that and maintain that authenticity that comes from Dashong? But how do you give people a sense of place and a sense of like being surrounded in an environment that is really in the mind of the artist? And so what we would do is, you know, uh, Dashong would storyboard a scene for us. And we would say, okay, this is a scene we're gonna do. He would draw boards for it for different shots and different moments in the scene. And then uh, David St. Amah, who's our animation director, would work with our, our small animation team. And we would basically build the environment in a 3D software, but we would just use shapes. So like a rectangle where a building is going to go, you know, or cube essentially, right? Mm -hmm. And we'd have lines where the street's going to be. So we would just sort of map these things out. And then we would take cameras in the 3D space, but from different perspectives, and we would take images. And we would print those images out on just a like a white sheet of paper. And so no, Dashong had something to work with. It's like, okay, building goes here, streets are going here, this kind of thing. And then he would just invest all of his own creativity in sort of rendering what his impressions of his hometown were like, you know? And so he would put all the detail right from his pen, but because he was doing that, even though he's doing it in two dimensions, he was doing it from different camera angles because we had printed out from multiple camera angles. So then we could scan each of his renditions and we could drape them onto the surfaces in the 3D space. And so this way, what happens in the 3D space is that the camera can move through, uh, you have this like perspective, right? You have a 3D perspective, you have parallax when you move around objects, but everywhere you look has all of that hyper detail from, uh, you know, from Dashong's own pen because it's been scanned right from his own pen. And e even if you see like the, you know, the taxi cabs that drive by and you see the street trolley, you see these like, you actually can see marker strokes because he even hand colored a lot of these things. And we would just scan his colorings and drape them again onto these surfaces. And that allowed us to keep the authenticity of his illustrations and his style, but to give people this kind of more immersive feeling like you're inside of the artist's mind and you're, you're in, a, you have a sense of place that you, you know where you are. And that's, if you can see it, I think most prominently in like the opening shot, which is just like a one that goes for over five minutes and you, the camera's swooping through the space. You really feel everywhere you turn, you could be arrested. There could be danger at every turn. And that really comes from this kind of unique production process that David St. Amat and, uh, and Yvonne and, and Dashong developed together with us. Okay. Yeah. That, that I gotta say it's, it, it was really amazing because there's some scenes that you have um, Dashon like drawing and then it comes to life. And that is just, uh, I, I really did love all of those type of scenes and as well, how how detailed they were as well in, in the drawing aspect and the 3D aspect as well. Um, my question would be next, how, how was it difficult to find the other members of the story? Because I know that there was, uh, at the end of the film, you do mention that some of them, um, you couldn't find them. Um, and then some of them uh, passed away. But was it difficult to find the members that are that are currently um, in the film? Yeah, it's not easy. I mean, there are some things worked out smoothly um, because Dashong had been living in New York for a period of time. He knew a few other Falun Gong adherents who were also from Changchun City. So I guess you go to the local group practice and you're like, oh, where are you from? And, oh, I'm from there, too. So they may or may not have known each other when they were in Changchun, but they start kind of connecting and realizing their own sort of shared things. So he had some friends in New York who were from Changchun and kind of then you start extending that and you find friends of friends and then eventually you're, you find people who knew the individuals in the film very well and could help to round things out. So that's one avenue that worked relatively smoothly. Smoothly finding the people who were directly involved in the TV hijacking 
was very, very difficult. And we're very fortunate that there is one surviving hijacker who's managed to get out of China under kind of very unique circumstances. He managed to get out of the country. And that's Mr. White, who we met in mm-hmm. Korea. And um, so when we learned about him, he had really just come out recently when we were shoot when we started shooting on that uh, on this film. So that really, really made the film possible. It gave us someone who was a direct participant so he could speak to the motivations, to all of the kind of the dynamics that were going on in the group, you know, uh, what the details of what the plan were and, you know, and all the elements were there for a typical heist story. You know, you have your plan, you have your kind of band of underdogs and you're kind of an eclectic group of people that you would not expect to be pulling this off. And then things don't go as planned, right? There's always this kind of change in things. So it had all the elements of a heist story there. And really we were just very fortunate that, that one from, from the film's perspective that Mr. White was able to get out of China. Obviously there are other reasons that that's very important from a humanitarian perspective, but for the film, uh, just from that angle, like we were very fortunate he was able to get out uh, and that he was very interested in sharing his story with us. So my, my question would be is uh, I, like I mentioned at, at the starting point of how this film feels more like a movie than a documentary was that your end goal when you were filming eternal springs it's a good question you know i think about it this way i mean you know when you're doing a documentary there's the particulars those are important the details are important you need to have those right but you know people still go to a documentary or to any film they're still looking for an experience you know they're not looking to be lectured to or to be you know just uh you know to re- just receive a bunch of really heavy information about something very troubling in the world i mean there is times where we need to consume that kind of stuff but i i wanted to create something that people were going to resonate with and really you know i'm not going to say enjoy because it's a heavy subject but in a sense enjoy like um to really find it finding it like a uh, something that really captures their attention and their emotions and that they really invest themselves in and it's an experience that they can lose themselves in and really kind of take something away from it so when you're going after that i think the process in a documentary is not really different from the process in a narrative film uh, or an, you know any kind of narrative production is it you're trying to find what are those elements of the story that sort of fit a, a typical story arc that people are going to resonate with right there's this journey and unfortunately in this case the elements were there because there is a you know it's like the the caper or the heist story like the the the, the elements of that kind of genre of story are the, all there it's just that the real life consequences are present which aren't typically the case in an oceans 11 or something like this right okay so so you find those pieces that people resonate with and and you know, that I think that just allows people to take more from the experience, you know, and then I'm also thinking myself, like, what are the things that really resonate with me? Why, when I hear this story, why am I so touched by it? Why, why do I find it so engaging? And how do I find a way, you know, to give everyone else that experience when they don't have the benefit of spending all this time with these people and reading through all this material? Like, how can they just get that in a 90 minute experience? And when you think deeply about what it is, that moves you, then you're kind of looking for those universal things that everyone's going to kind of connect with. And I think you should be doing that, whether you're making a narrative film or a documentary. Okay. That, yeah, I, I gotta say, because, uh, it, it, my experience while watching it, it was very different because I, I, I'm, I'm usually very into documentaries, uh, because I want to know more about different stories or events that happened when I was not born. Um, Mm -hmm seeing eternal springs was like that experience as well but for me i it felt more as a as a more film driven than a documentary because everything was like animated voiceovers mm-hmm. and it was really really amazing um so so jason one of the things that i wanted to ask you is is falun gone still illegal in China, the persecution continues. And that's one of those things that I hope the film can shine a bit of a light on quite a number of years back. Like I mentioned, I first encountered Falun Gong in uh, in the late 90s. It was 1998. Mm-hmm. They started the crackdown on people who were practicing Falun Gong in China in 1999. And in the early stages, it was in the news. There was actually even a, a Pulitzer Prize winning series in the Wall Street Journal by Ian Johnson that sort of charted this, this persecution campaign and, and what the, you know, the communist regime was doing to kind of 
try and persecute these people and root out the practice, etc. But what happens is that there's always some other tragedy in the world. So people kind of move on to something else and they move on to something else. And we tend to think if we don't hear about something that maybe things have changed or things it's a thing in the past. And I think at a certain point, the Communist Party probably liked that idea. They stopped talking about it as well. They used to like, you know, if you went to the Chinese consulate to try and get a visa to travel there, they would uh, have, you know, a display booth telling you about the evils of Falun Gong and how it's, this, you know, you know, scourge on society and this dangerous thing. They don't do that so much anymore. And I think they liked the idea of people thinking that it was gone and that it, it was a thing of the past. But um the reality, unfortunately, is that the persecution continues and there are still many people practicing Falun Gong in China. And you can find that through the sort of Falun Gong uh, websites where people from inside of China manage to get some of their own information out. They will share their experiences in the practice amidst the persecution and their efforts to kind of get the word out about what's going on to people. And you can see it's as active as ever there. So there still is a, a body of people practicing it actively. And unfortunately, there are still people constantly being arrested. Even if you look in the lead up to the Winter Olympics this past year in, or this year in, in Beijing, there was another sort of escalated round of arrests of Falun Gong adherents, perhaps because they felt with the international media there that they were concerned that Falun Gong might sort of shine a light on what was happening in terms of the repression. Oh, wow. So. So this is all very recent. Mr. White, as I mentioned, just coming out of China as we began shooting on this film. And there's other people depicted in this film who are still, uh, you know, under some kind of house arrest or, you know, under these kinds of pressure and stuff as well inside China today. Oh, wow. That's wow. That's uh, a lot of information to get to get through and still knowing that there's still people out there that was want to just freely practice uh a a lifestyle i would say or or, or mm -hmm. religion and they're still being um persecuted for that and that's really shocking in my side um and i just i just gotta say jason because i know that you've worked on another documentary that it's basically um exposing more information of that area and i've noticed that um, not a lot of filmmakers uh, do this, you know, like, hey, this this still is actually happening. This is still this what this is what happened a few years ago back. So. So, Jason, my question would be, um, do you have any up other upcoming projects um, besides the fact that uh, Eternal Springs is still running and it, it's making a lot of buzz in social media as well? Mm hmm. Yeah, so on the feature film side of things, I don't have another China feature like lined up right now on the Chinese human rights angle. Uh, we're doing a sort of spin-off virtual reality experience with Eternal Spring because there's just elements of the story we didn't explore in the film itself. And I feel VR is very powerful, not so much for like telling a linear story, but for putting yourself into someone else's shoes and experiencing something firsthand. So we're taking sort of a different crack at, at some element of the story there. Um, but, you know, and there there have been people, uh, you know, from other communities as well that are repressed in China who've spoken with me and, you know, encouraged me to tackle with, you know, perhaps a similar approach, some issues in, in, uh, in other areas that are related to China, whether that's Hong Kong or Taiwan or with the Uyghurs in the Northwest and such. And so I have a concern about the overall human rights situation in China, and that's a possibility. Um, in the meantime, I, you know, I kind of have an attention deficit issue and I work across different areas in my, in my company. So we're doing a sci-fi animated series and another narrative video game as well, and sort of playing across different spaces. And I do find that each thing that I tackle, I kind of learn something. And perhaps if you feel sort of elements of a, of a narrative film or narrative storytelling in here, perhaps it's because we work across different mediums as well. And we're kind of bringing the lessons that we learn from one to another. So so we're doing a, a variety of things, but right now, um, really a lot of the focus is around having Eternal Spring be as widely seen as it, as it can, because it has had this great response. It's been you know, selected to represent Canada for the Oscars, which is a, a great honor in the international feature um, category. And, you know, because of that, there's a lot of doors that have been opened and we're going to do our best to, you know, to try and, uh, you know, take advantage of that both to, for the film success and to, uh, you know, shine a light on what's continuing to go on in China. No, yeah, I, I'm super, I'm super amazed of how the people have reacted with this film, uh, especially myself. Uh, I gotta say that uh, putting putting that information out there makes 
a lot of like noise in regards to making people see what's going on outside of like their house or where they live or mm -hmm. their country, you know. So I, I, I got to say, Jason, it's it's really amazing what you're doing in regards to to this film and your and your previous films as well. So, Jason, I want to thank you very much for for your time um, to talk about Eternal Springs and all the process that that you that you go through to to make this film happen. Um, and again, I just hope that when when the time comes for the Oscars, I, I, I hope that Eternal Springs get gets that award. It really deserves it a lot in in regards and in, in all in all aspects, I can say, you know, thank you, thank so you much, very John. much. Really appreciate so, it. Yes. And for everybody that's watching us here at the Nerdy Basement, we will see you in the next one. And thank you very much once again, Jason, for your time um, to talk about Eternal Springs. Thanks for having me, John.